Okay, Foster Care Nation. This week, we are going to revisit a broadcast we did a good long while back with Fiona Miles. She's an author of the book, This Is Me, I'm Adopted. And if she didn't have such an amazing story, I would want to hear it again just because she has that amazing Scottish accent. But she has an awesome story on top of it. So take a moment, sit back, listen to this one. And if you haven't found her book, pick it up and take a look. We'll see you guys soon. You can forget a lot of things, Foster Care Nation, but never forget this. You're listening to Unparalleled Studio. I think no. Foster Care Nation, listen up. This is Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey. Strength for the powerless, courage for the fearful, hope and healing for wounded hearts. Welcome back to Foster Care, an unparalleled journey with Jason and no Amanda. Sorry, guys, but she was on the last recording. We just finished up and now she's running off to go run errands. So it's just me and I have an author for you here to listen to today. So you don't have to just hear listen to me. Fiona Miles has a book called This Is Me. Fiona, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. All right. Now, this is me. I assume that you, this has got something to do with the foster care system, the adoption system, and you have some connection in there. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you're connected with this system? Yeah. Um, yeah, the book is This Is Me, I'm Adopted, because I was adopted as a child. So I was adopted when I was eight months old. Um, I had been given up straight away um, from birth. Uh, my natural parent didn't uh, want me. So um, I had spent a few weeks in hospital and then went to various foster places. And then my mum and dad came and chose me. And I was adopted at eight months old or around eight months old. Okay, so we can tell that you are definitely not from the deep south of America. I don't hear New York in there. I'm trying to place that accent somewhere in the States, and I don't think that's what I'm hearing. So should I just go ahead and assume that you maybe weren't in the American foster system or adoption system? Um, well, no, actually, I'm from, I am Scottish, and um, I live in Manchester in England. So um, I'm part of the British adoption uh, system. Oh, wow. So we went straight up international on this one call. We're talking in America. You're in Britain or in England and you're from Scotland. Wow. That's a whole lot of pieces there, huh? <laughs> uh, maybe that's why I'm, I couldn't figure out your accent exactly. I don't know. We'll, we'll blame it on that. Yeah. <laughs> Us Americans are terrible at that. So I, I will just go ahead and jump right in. You were adopted at eight months old. So did you know that as a child when you, was that a part of your regular conversation? Yeah, yeah. From about the age of six, I remember being told by my mother that I was um, chosen and special uh, and adopted. So it's kind of like those sort of three words were in, always in the same sentence for me. You know, you're chosen, you're special, you're adopted. Um, and, I, you know, I kind of didn't really, I suppose I didn't really understand what she was talking about. You know, I, I, I kind of figured out, yeah, OK, so I'm I'm not quite the same as my brothers and sisters then. You know, because I don't hear you calling them special and chosen or adopted, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, I do remember around six-year-old, that was the first time I was told. And then, you know, as I've gone on, it just kept being repeated, you know, until it kind of sunk in. Um, and then when it did sink in, that's when, you know, I really sort of rebelled against it because I just didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't want to be adopted. You know, I thought I didn't understand, you know, why was I, taken from where I should have been and, and all the rest of it. But I think it's very difficult to just tell a child, you know, that these things w without any sort of intervention or any support or whatever. So, you know, and you're as a, as a kid, you're just expected to understand and be, you know, okay with it. 
Okay, well, I'm just going to say that my mama raised me right, and I know not to make any assumptions because it makes this out of this and that, as she would always say. And <laughs> and I also know that you look like you were eight months more than a couple of years ago. So when you were when you were first at that age where you were hearing that, I'm assuming that was probably that time frame was probably not a time frame where they talked about adoption very openly and maybe not even kindly. No, it was definitely a time when it wasn't sort of spoken about and no one else kind of, I didn't know anybody else that was adopted um, and um, it wasn't something that was spoken about. And I was, I wouldn't, I wasn't kind of encouraged to tell anybody else either, really, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, when I, when I was six and I remember being told that I'm going back 50 years so um, there wasn't the the support and network and stuff that we have now. Um, and also living in Scotland in a very small village, you know, there was no social workers involved. Um, I don't think my mum and dad probably even knew that social workers could be involved because they never, they never asked for any to become involved, even when things got a little bit um, tense and whatever, you know, with, with, with the way I was not managing the information. Okay, yeah, because they handled stuff differently in different places and different times. And so in the U.S., if you tried to say that today, people would lose their mind. If you tried to have an adoption that did not have a social worker involved, we'd probably have social workers involved to call and tell you that you're doing this horrible thing, and it would be really bad. So that's a whole different paradigm that the people in that time frame were, were working with, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. So, so as, as you got old enough to have to start dealing with some of these thoughts was that something that you were ashamed about or was it just a part of your life that was accepted you know both in your own mind and in the community you around your friend group well as fact for me I am I I didn't I, I felt awful being adopted you know I just felt awful that I had been removed from my real family you know in, in inverted commas I suppose and I couldn't understand why, you know, why would that have happened, you know? And even though my parents, you know, tried to explain that, you know, that my natural parent couldn't keep me and different things. And But one of the sort of um, difficulties that I had as well was that they seemed to have this information that my older sister had been kept and I had been adopted out. And that as well kind of created its own difficulties in my mind then all I'm thinking about is okay so what was so wrong with me you know that the older sister was kept and I was kind of you know chucked into foster care or wherever it was in the beginning so I, it, there was a lot for me to kind of try and you know lock in and I was unfortunately I was in between two natural siblings I had an older brother and a younger sister who were my mum and dad's own children so I was in the middle of them so again, that kind of didn't it didn't make for the an idyllic situation for an adoptee. Yeah, that middle child syndrome steps in again. I'm a middle kid, so I, I understand some of the middle child syndrome. But you know, you you touched on something there the way that 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 affected your ability to understand if you were really good enough. Why am I not good enough? That my natural parents wanted didn't want to keep me. What what's wrong with me? Is that a thought process you dealt with, or am I just you know, coming up with, with mm -hmm. wrong ideas here. No, that was definitely something that um, was, a, it was a huge factor all the way through, like my childhood, my teens, early adulthood, you know, what exactly was wrong with me? What, what is, and what is wrong with me? Because I just couldn't seem to manage, you know, my emotions. I couldn't manage my, you know, to keep myself from being angry all the time. So I grew up a very angry, troubled child, became a very troubled, angry teenager, went off into the wide world and ended up on drugs, you know, drinking alcohol, getting into the most awful situations, you know, where anything could have happened to me, all in this sort of search of trying to work out what on earth was, what is wrong with me, you know, because growing up, um, I, my behaviour was pretty bad because I couldn't deal with what was going on. But I was just put down as not a child, you know, don't be so bad. Why Why can't you be like your brother and sister? And, you know, and things like that. Obviously, I can't be like them because I'm adopted. But anyway, you know, this was always kind of thrown out 
you know, as as a kind of why can't you be like them? And that I, it just it just compounded that feeling of not being like anybody and you know being different and being rejected and not wanted and you know you, for me I kind of had this constant failure thing going on. You know, I failed as a baby even to, to to be able to be kept by this woman that gave birth to me, you know, and then failed as a an adoptee because I was not good like my brother and sister and stuff like that. So this sort of trail of failure and, you know, emotional craziness just kind of, it was just with me all the time. You know, I can only imagine just how much that that resonates in a lot of people's world because they feel that way from one reason or another. But for a kid like you who were who was in the situation you were in, it only makes sense that that's that's part of it. Although as a kid, you don't realize that that makes sense that you're struggling with that. You know, wh what age did you start reaching into the drugs and alcohol that that really caused you the problems? Hey there, Foster Care Nation. We'd like to take a quick minute to step out of the podcast here and ask you guys for a little bit of support. If you could share an episode with people, friends, in a group, with family, anywhere where there's somebody who would like to hear this. Also, if you'd like to join us and support our mission, a couple dollars a month would be really helpful. You can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash foster care nation. Now back to the show. What age did you start reaching into the drugs and alcohol that, that really caused you the problems? I uh, probably started t uh, taking drugs about 16. Here in the late, in the States, we might call that a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say that now, but it's true. I, I know that my kids have, some of my kids have told stories after, well, after they left school, I've got a couple older kids who talk about, you know, the drug trade inside of their middle school now. You know, and middle school is what um, starts at sixth grade. So we're talking like 12 ish, 12, 13 years old. And, and we see that starting there. So I guess that's a good thing that it happened a little bit later um, for you, because let's be honest, no 12 or 13 year old is well served by drugs and or alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so what um what did that look like for you when you got into what's you know, were, were you was it alcohol, the kind of the gateway into the the other stuff? Were you into the hard drugs, or or did you just, you know, were you one of the kids who played around with like marijuana and and some beer? Yeah, I think for me it was alcohol in the beginning, and then with the alcohol it was smoking weed, and then kind of moved on into taking speed, um, LSD because obviously I'm a lot older, so LSD, you know, in in the sort of early eighties was the thing, you know, with the hash and the speed and whatever. Um, and thankfully, I didn't go down the route of heroin use, which, um, you know, is pretty prevalent now. So um, so it was just like a mixture of those just on a sort of daily basis, just keeping myself ticking over with one thing or another, one to, one to go up, one to come down, one to go up, one to come down. Wow. I, and I can't even imagine what that does to the mind of a 16-year-old because I was 16 once. And I remember that 16-year-old Jason, he wasn't a very smart guy. He wasn't good at handling a whole lot of emotional stuff either at that age. You know, I can't imagine that didn't make that super difficult for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, for me, um, getting into that kind of lifestyle, it kind of it sort of numbed whatever was going on because in within that sort of um, set of circumstances I got involved with a lot of really crazy people so a lot of very difficult things happened to me I ended up being prostituted out of a house you know at 17 just gullible I'm from the countryside in Scotland and I had now gone down to London and England where you know it was a whole different world really um for someone like myself coming from a small sort of village in Scotland so um and then um, I, I ended up getting involved with people that were, you know, selling drugs um, um, and, and just got into some really difficult situations. You know, some pretty bad stuff happened to me, um, which, again, you know, taking drugs and alcohol helped me to just not have to actually deal with it because I still had to deal with the other stuff, you know, the adopted stuff, the failure stuff, the rejection stuff and all the rest of it, you know. So, yeah. That failure part that you mentioned... I mean, who among us hasn't felt that at some point 
but at that age and those level of issues, you mentioned that you were using it to numb. And, Mm -hmm. oh, man, that's that's something that that is so prevalent in today's society. We see so many people who use drugs and or alcohol to just numb the emotions. Where did you find the strength to step out of that or, or to get through the emotional regulation issues to where you didn't need to use chemical substances to, to feel, to be able to feel appropriately, I guess would be the right way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, to get the, the way I found the strength to come out of that was I actually became a Christian. Um, just through a, a set of circumstances, I met somebody who invited me along to a church you know, which I kind of didn't really want to go to because I kind of thought I was of the belief that maybe somebody like me wouldn't be able to set foot in a church. You know, why would, you know, why would anybody like me be allowed to be in that kind of environment? But um, yeah, I soon found out that it was, you know, it was the best thing that I ever did. You know, I, I went along because I thought I was at rock bottom. I was like, what? where else can I go? What else can I do? I've got nothing to lose by giving this a try, you know, and just going along and seeing what it's all about. And um, yeah, so I I made that choice to become a Christian and the journey, you know, to from there, that was about 29. But the journey from there to here was was still long. I can't say I had this moment, a flash of light and all that and everything was wonderful because um, that isn't how it happened. But I definitely had a moment where I knew that things were going to change and, you know, a bit of balance began to to take place. You said that happened at 29 years old? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I have to ask that about that whole space between the 16-year-old Fiona and the 29-year-old Fiona. What did that look like and what was your rock bottom that made you decide, I need to do different? It was utter chaos utter chaos it was just one thing after another you know I found I did find my natural family when I was about 21 22 and thinking that that would be the answer to you know so many wrongs or things that I didn't understand and it was nice to find them it was nice to meet people who looked like me it was nice to find out that I had sisters who were you know had a a similar personality to me but at the end of the day, you know, after spending some time with them, I realised that I was kind of the cuckoo in that nest as well, because they'd all been brought up together and they all knew each other inside out, you know, and whatever. And it kind of made that that sort of tilt for me where I, w- I knew I was the cuckoo in that nest and I always thought I was the cuckoo in the nest I'd been brought up in. But it tilted me into that place of, well, actually, the nest I was brought up in, that is my nest if that makes sense. You know, that's what it did for me anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I from about 22, 23, I was still in that place, you know, of, of taking drugs, drinking and whatever. And um, I began to take seizures um, and stuff like that. Um, and things started to medically not be good, you know, just because I'd been constantly doing this for so long. And I'd been in some pretty violent situations and, you know, there was a lot of things going on. Um, and so it was basically I'd gone into the infirmary, the hospital, it's called the infirmary in Scotland, the hospital, and they had said, if you don't stop this, you know, you might not come out of the next seizure you have. So there was a moment where I was like, okay, this is this is really serious, you know, I need to think about what I'm doing here and why I'm doing it, you know. You know, God has a way of getting a hold of us, doesn't he? Definitely. (laughs) (laughs) For me, it's been, uh, you know, I've had my own medical struggles and I found out at one point, oh, a few years ago that, you know, the doctor looked at an MRI in my brain and said, you have several strokes. I went, huh? (laughs) Oh, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, and so fortunately, I, I've been super fortunate that they haven't really affected me in the long term negatively, but I have to figure out what to do with that. And so it sounds like, you know, maybe God was trying to get a hold of you and turn you around. Um, I, I like this to ask people this question, though. Um, have you figured out why God puts you on the earth right now, like what your, your job is? <laughs> what my job is right now yeah I mean basically for me right now um getting my story written and 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 into you know it's over two books because one book is 
almost, it's all the stuff, you know, that I kind of brushed over a bit. It's all the stuff, you know, and, and how I came to know Christ and how I wasn't a great Christian either. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been quite honest about the mistakes I made, you know, coming into the, you know, that the world of Christ and, and Christians and whatever. And then, like, the second book kind of focuses on more on, you know, the feelings of being adopted. And and then it would, I also have I've gone through 33 years of infertility. I always wanted to make my own nest. And um, that never happened. Uh, it, you know, I wasn't ever able to have a baby. And then, um, this is going to sound a bit strange, but God spoke to me um, when I was in my 40s. And he told me I would have a child at 50. And I was a bit kind of like, can you not make it a little sooner? <laughs> 50 is quite old <laughs> to start all that, you know. But um, what he did was he had already you know, pre-planned and pre, you know, got everything ready for my little girl to be born, you know, to my nephew from the family I was adopted out of. So it's, it's, a, it's a very unusual situation that we have here, but um, I now have sole care with my husband of my little girl, Georgie, um, and she came to us six weeks before I was 51, so what God told me came to pass, you know, and, and I, I even stood up in my church when I, when, when I was told this by God and told the whole church, which was a big church, that this is what had been said, you know, and everybody knew my story of not being able to have children. So it was a big thing for me to get up and say that, you know, but I just knew that it was going to come to pass. I didn't know how it was going to come to pass. And never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that God would have given me a child from my own blood line? It was just incredible. Yeah, I, I'm just going to draw a couple parallels there. Um, um, forgive my my lack of memory. Was that um, Abraham and Sarah? Wasn't that that kind of their story? Yeah, well, yeah, she waited a long time. Yeah, she was in her nineties, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm just gonna say, God has a sense of humor because if you told me I had to start raising a newborn at ninety, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like I am yeah. in my forties and it's a struggle now. Ninety, uh, uh-uh, <laughs> I, w- I want to be asleep by then. I, I, I have a long nap plan at that age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, faith is is a component for a lot of people in this journey, and. I know plenty of people it's not, and I hope nobody just tunes out and assumes that it's, this is, you know, all some sort of, some sort of story that they don't need to hear. But man, finding that faith, that thing to believe in that the real true North and understanding that, you know, what your, your purpose in life is, you know, I, I believe that God has a plan. He's put us all here for a reason. And I also believe that most of us aren't going to know what that reason is until after we've already started our journey. Mm-hmm. You know, that's so how, how old is your little girl now? She's six now. Yeah, she's six and a half. So she's, um, yeah, she's a fireball. She's, <laughs> she's, a, she's an incredible bringer of joy to, to so many people. She has, she has special needs. She has complex needs. She was born um, addicted to every drug and alcohol you can think of. And she had a brain hemorrhage uh, during her withdrawals. So that's brought about, you know, its own difficulties for her. Uh, but where where she may not be able to read or write or or do some of the things that kids should be able to do at six, she has this amazing personality where she's not shy. You know, she everybody is just, you know, for smiling at or talking to. Um, so she brings a lot of joy, you know, especially in our neighbourhood where there's a lot of elderly people. You know, everybody knows our little... Georgie. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, cause man, sometimes, sometimes we forget, you know, I, we've got a, a little one staying with us right now. And, and Amanda, my, my wife and I, you know, we discussed, we've discussed a number of times whether or not we would be open to adopting any more kids because currently I, I have seven that I own and that's a lot. That is a lot for anybody. Mm-hmm. And then I meet these people with more and I think y'all are crazy, but I look at it and go, okay, with, the age I'm at, if we were to adopt a, a newborn baby today, I would be well into my 60s by the time she graduates high school. And 
I don't know, maybe I'm just a little, being a little selfish here, but I'm thinking somewhere around retirement age, I'm going to want to relax, take a nap more than, than you would get to do if you had a teenage kid at home, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's been something that, that has made me a little bit concerned about about you know that idea of bringing another kid in sometimes it's i hear god laughing at me and just giggling on the side i think i think he has plenty of other plans for me that i i don't know about yet but until then we'll just we'll just sit here and try and pretend like we know what's going on but that's something that actually my a friend of mine and i were discussing the other day is the idea of of grandparents raising kids you know or grandparents raising their children which this obviously isn't your your grandchild, but it's in the same generation. Mm -hmm. What kind of struggles yeah. does that prevent for, present for you? Um, I, I think it, it, in a way, the, one of the one of the struggles I had in, when she did start to go into school, you know, I was a bit, I was very aware that the other parents were all young, you know, and younger, um, and so it was assumed quite a lot that you know when I was bringing the child to school that I was the granny. You know, so I had to kind of correct people quite often when they would say to Georgie, oh, is this your granny? You know, and Georgie would be very offended, you know, and saying a big loud voice, no, that's my mummy. You know, so it was kind of like awkward moment. But, um, you know, I think now that she's getting older and people around, they all they know us now, so it's not as awkward as it was, you know, in the, in the beginning. But I do, sometimes I do consider the fact that as, you know, obviously as she's getting older, we're getting older. Um, and, you know, I do, I just, I do think to myself, I, I would love to just see her safely into adulthood, you know, because she does have problems and issues and whatever. So I'd like to, you know, be given enough years to just see her in adulthood and make sure that she's, you know, going to be cared for, you know, as an adult. So that'd be great if that was... <laughs> Yes, yes. I, you know, that's again, that's another one of the thoughts that I, I've had with with even some of our other kids. It's just because I've had some health struggles and I look at it and go, man, you know, uh, hopefully this is if this is God's plan. I know he's got an answer for the end, but and I know that I don't necessarily get to know it. <laughs> I don't get to know what those plans are, you know. Mm -hmm. I, there's an old song that I mentioned a lot of times because I love the line that says, if you want to hear God laugh, just tell him your plans. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think he has a good a good giggle now and then when he hears me thinking because <laughs> my plans are never the ones that work out in the long run. But that's mm -hmm. you know that struggle for understanding what it's you know what it's like to raise a kid in today's world. Um, it's you know it's been a few years since you or I was a kid, but we didn't have to deal with like the struggles of social media. Mm, yeah, that's true. That's something that I kind of it is a concern. I think it's it's maybe less of a concern for me with my child because of the needs that she has. She she kind of just looks at things on YouTube and she just loops the same thing over, you know, and, and, and it's rare that she moves, you know, onto something else. We kind of have to move in and say, right, that's going to fry your head if you watch it again. So she's not really into girly stuff yet or anything, you know, whereas a lot of young, even at her age, you know, little kids are in getting their nails done and all the rest of it, whereas she's not really interested in all that. I, I, yeah, I'm sure it'll come, but I think I'm blessed that it's going to be a bit later, you know, down the line for her. Yeah, count your blessings there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we deal with things with kids in, in a, a whole different generation who grew up in a whole different world. I mean, Things like if you grew up in a rural town in Scotland, um, your experience versus hers, like we, we've had this whole, we're just going to call it a generational trauma, if you will, that we've spent an entire lifetime with for some of these kids living with this this boogeyman out there, whether it was Osama bin Laden or or um, Saddam Hussein or whoever the current one is, you know, there, there's there's all these huge things that we all know about now because because it's not just on the five o'clock news for, for 30 or mm -hmm. 60 minutes. It's on social media. It's everywhere. And my, my 14 year old daughter comes home and she talks about some of the stuff where these kids in, in high school are, are, you know, all think they're experts on politics mm -hmm. and they're having yeah. these discussions about stuff that, that they don't truly understand. And 
but they a lot of it is this fear stuff. You know, right now we're as we record this, we're kind of in the middle of this Ukrainian Russian conflict going on over there, and everybody's yeah. afraid of World War Three breaking out. And my gosh, to hand that to these kids and expect them not to to have some special level of anxiety and and, and concern is is just silly to to realize that. You know, if you don't realize that they're yeah. going to be struggling from that, does she see a lot of that stuff in in the world going on? Does that bother her? Hey there, Foster Care Nation. If you'd like to find yourself in a group with like-minded people, head over to Facebook, and you can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash foster care UJ. We've got a group over there where we talk about foster care, we talk about adoption, and we talk about all the things related. If your podcast player allows it, you can also reach down and hit that subscribe button so you get notified every week when we put up uploads. Every Tuesday, a new episode comes out. We'd love to see you next week. Now back to the show. If you don't realize that they're going to be struggling from that, does she see a lot of that stuff in, in the world going on? Does that bother her? Um, she, she the, Strangely enough, this evening, she doesn't normally um, see much of the news, but um, the uh, our um, schedule on the television has changed um, and she came through where there would normally be something, you know, kitty on, but the news was on and um, she was seeing these um, people fleeing, you know, from, from Ukraine and she was kind of like, what, what's happening there? What, you know, why are they, why are they running, who are they running away from? So I was trying to explain to her because I, I kind of feel very much um, that there's no point in sugarcoating something. Um, like, but you know, so I was trying to explain to her that it's something called a war where two people are fighting, you know, and it's causing all these people to have to move away, you know, and and things like that. Um, so she, you know, she was kind of like, okay, then, and but it was boring, you know, so she just left the room. But uh, so she doesn't thankfully have too much of a, but I'm ready for her if she comes back with any sort of questions, you know. Oh, yeah, you have to be, because they'll be back with questions. They always are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now you, you have a book, you know, This Is Me, I'm Adopted. So can you tell us a little bit about your book and, and where that came from and what it's about? Well, basically, um, the books are my story. And the the reason I wrote the second one as a second book, because I could, I could have lumped it all in one book, but I felt like there was two sides, two parts, you know, whereas the second part... This is me, I'm adopted. It contains the, the, the sort of emotional side of, of being adopted and some of the ridiculous things that people say to adopted kids, you know, and, and stuff like that, that maybe they don't understand are not nice. And, you know, thinking back, obviously my story is 60s, 70s when I was a child. So, you know, people don't even speak like that anymore. Well, I hope not anyway. But um, so some of those little things are, are, are in there as catalytic moments where something was said that, that just, um, you know, compounded those feelings of being different, you know, not part of the family and, and other people not seeing me as part of the family, but as something else, you know. Um, and it's unfortunate that people, you know, did say things like that they said, but that's just, you know, people were more... Or were, were less educated, I suppose, then. So, the, like, the reasoning behind the books as well is that I want people to read them and, and be able to, you know, identify with the honesty in them and identify with the, the feelings that are in them and also to be, you know, hopefully given, you know, an element of hope, you know, when I talk about my faith, which my faith is discussed in both books, you know, in a in a fairly light-hearted way, but an honest way as well. And um, you know, one of the things that I'm doing now with the books is um, I'm sending them free into prisons and taking them free to um, you know women's groups where they're you know that where they're a domestic abuse or things like that. Because I really feel that you know it, it's not about making money off them; it's about getting the hope and the story out there. So, you know, my heart, I, I've kind of stopped promoting them as such all over my social medias and whatever. I'm now just kind of, you know, whenever I get some money, I'm just pouring them into the prisons and into groups and stuff like that. I'd rather give them away to someone who doesn't know um, God, 
and someone who really needs to hear that there's people out there that have been through the stuff you've been through and they've made it, you know, into a better place, a more balanced life. You know, I, I have a good relationship. I've been married nearly 20 years, whereas, you know, before all that, there was loads of totally chaotic relationships and plenty of them, you know. So, you know, it's just to give a bit of hope out there. You know, I don't know if there's many more callings that's more important than giving hope to the hopeless in this life. And it sounds like that's what you've been called to do because, you know, I, I don't know about anywhere overseas. I know that here in the States, um, I met a guy I talked to who was a, um, he was, I believe he worked as a, as a guard in a prison somewhere. And one of the things that he's, he had mentioned was as he met these guys who were there, the overwhelming majority of the men who were in the prison he was working in were all former foster youth. Wow. And the fact that so many kids come through that foster and adoptive situation and then don't end up with a solid family connection as they grow out of that and how that affects their life and aging out of the system and how many of those kids end up homeless, addicted to some sort of substance, and eventually mm -hmm. in the criminal justice system as well. So the fact that you're reaching there, I think, is is incredibly powerful. You know, your target yeah. audience is waiting for your story. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and that's that's my aim is to get as many out there out there into those into the prisons, so that um, yeah, to make a difference really. That's what I believe that God called me to write the the stories because I I, I wrote them both within a year and 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 had them you know published and out there within a year. You know both of them, and I just believe that I was just God gave me the the time in the pandemic because I couldn't go out to work. I was stuck at home. My child was allowed to go to school because she's vulnerable, she has special needs. So she was she was out of the house and I was in the house for a change. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I've been given this time. I'm not just going to sit here and waste it, you know. And that's when, I, you know, I just believe I was called to get the stories written, the books done and out there. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I probably would have used it for a nap time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a napper. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with all the things we have going on, I, I, I'm a napper whenever possible, which is maybe once in a blue moon. That's about it. That's all I get for now. <laughs> but I wish I could be. So, you know, you, you've, your story has, has tells a, a whole lot of, of that, uh, of your history. I'm curious, as, as you became an adult and as you moved out into a more mature human being who started to understand all these things, do you still have a, a connection with your adoptive family? Um, yeah. Um, do you mean the family I was brought up with? Yes. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, my mum, my mum and dad are both dead, but my brother and sister um, were very close. You know, my sister in particular. I think you know, sisters are more are closer, I think, than sisters and brothers. But maybe that's just our family. But you know, my sister and I are very, very close. Um, um, my brother and I, we, you know, we're close, but it's not as not an everyday thing, you know. Um, and, you know, aunts and uncles, whatever. Yeah, have, because, if, like I said, you know, I realised that, you know, I was the cuckoo in the nest from the biological family, which kind of tilted me back into the, well, actually, this is, this that is your nest, you know, that's where you have been nurtured, fed, brought up, you know, regardless of whether you liked it or not, you know, that that's, that is your nest, you know, and, and as for the biological family, uh, the biological mum, she died as well in 2005. Um, and the sisters and brothers that I have there, I have a kind of um, a polite relationship with, you know, the odd message now and again. Um, and um, I've only just actually discovered through the DNA, this ancestry thing, who my biological uh, father might be. So that's, that's, that's a little new track I'm on at the moment. So... That's it. Uh, you know, I've still there, I've tracked down what I think is a half sister, and we've spoken on um, you know, this video kind of chat thing, and she's very willingly said she'll do a DNA as well, so that to to make that connection, you know, a reality because it, it's possible that it's another brother or, you know, that that may have been the father. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because and 
I'll be honest, it's possible that we might be related because I did the DNA thing and they circled all of Europe and they're like, yeah, you're from there. You know, like 5%, 10% from all of them, but I'm from somewhere over there. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. So God only knows what, what connection may or may not exist there, but you know, that's, that's a cool thing that in nowadays that they have is that DNA thing, the, the DNA connection, um, now, your daughter, you know who her biological family is, right? It's it's part of your family. Yes. So how yeah. does that how does that connection work? Is that something that you're able to to keep open or is that something that needs to be needs some some borders around it? No, it's really um it's quite healthy at, at the moment. It's you know, she has a fantastic relationship with her nana who is her biological mum's mum. Um so she's fantastic you know and she she and there's not a lot of people can manage uh, Georgie because she does have her own ways and whatever but Nana's been fantastic at you know working alongside us and wanting to know exactly how do we manage her so so that she can do the same thing to keep her on an even keel um, and her other Nana you know she has sporadic um, contact which is fine that you know whatever her natural mum unfortunately died in 2020 and um, she'd been in prison and we were we'd had great contact when she was in prison and I was able to send her lots of letters in prison and photos you know and we were going to be doing um some uh one-to-one contact so that Georgie could meet her and get to know her like Georgie's got pictures all over her bedroom wall of her natural family as well so that she's you know educated as to who they all are um, but unfortunately, mum came out of prison and went back on the drugs and had a, a heart failure and died. So I had to, I just kind of got Georgie around to the, the fact that she was going to meet her uh, mum. And uh, then I had to tell Georgie that mummy had died. So that was really, really difficult. It's difficult for us. It was difficult for Georgie. It was difficult all around. So... Yeah, she's been through a lot, this little girl, but she's brilliant. It's amazing what these kids can rebound from. And, you know, lest we we put too much emphasis on the resilience of kids, I mean, today's generations of kids have have had more traumas that they've had to deal with. And it's, it's really sad to see. And a lot of it is focused around a drug addiction. That's where I see a lot of grandparents raising their, their children. I mean, are their grandchildren, my stepmom has had a, uh, a hand in a lot of her children's. Um, I have a double half step nephew. I don't know what you would call him exactly. He was, he was my step sister's, um, son. And then, mm-hmm my stepmom and my dad end up raising him she had um she ended up passing away from a nasty genetic disease and so they raised him and and so he called my stepmom mom although it was his grandma and it got really confusing how i just call him timmy <laughs> i just called him timmy it was easier that way and um so yeah but you know he she has another daughter who's who's had a lot of struggles with addiction in her life as well and she's had a big hand in raising helping to to raise her kids as well and that's just something that that is almost at pandemic level here in the states with grandparents thinking they were done raising their kids and then finding out, um, you're not done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that something that you see over there a, a whole lot in, in Europe? You see a lot of that going on today? Yeah, yeah, there is. There's a lot of it. A lot, and we have something over here called special guardianship, and that's where you would go to court and so that you uh, get the parental rights so that you know the, 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 the mom and dad can't just come and take the children. But um, yeah, I mean, the na- Georgie's nana, she has, um, I think, raised three or four other children, you know, from another daughter of hers that unfortunately, you know, wasn't able to bring her own children up. So, she, you know, she's um, she's one of those grandparents that have, have done that, you know. Wow. Yeah, I, I think there's there's probably something in that that, that I, I need to do some research on and, and maybe even figure out a series on that because it's it's such a, a big thing and I, I guess uh, my selfishness looks at it and goes right now I'm looking going ooh, I don't another little little one like ah, that's a lot for me but and I 
I'm barely to the age where I could have grandchildren yet. I don't have any. None, none of our, our children have, have had any kids yet. Um, but but I'm at that point where I, I have to, to question whether or not I'm too selfish to do that because let's be honest, I'm tired. You know, we've, we're working on on seven kids and, and I've got a ways to go. Our youngest is six years old. And so yeah. as, as you think through that, that thought, I look at people like you and I'm like, wow, that is an intense level of bravery to step in at 50 years old and say, yep, that's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take care of that. So, I mean, number one, it, it tells us that you care about people, right? It, you, you have a deep level of care in your life. And mm-hmm. man, I, I can appreciate that a lot because we don't have a lot of those folks, but tell me what it was it, you know, did you struggle with making that decision or was that just a really simple yes for you? It was, it was, a, it was a, a simple yes, because, you know, I knew that I had had that word and I knew, you know, that God had told me I would have a child at 50. And um, so when, I, cause I had no idea that this little girl had even been born, it was a kind of, it was almost like this fluke thing that happened that brought me back into contact with my sister. She became a Christian. She was getting baptised. So another sister thought that because she knew I was a Christian, I would want to come to her baptism. And so she told me that, you know, my sister had become a Christian and was getting baptised. So I turned up as a surprise, because I live in England, they live in Scotland, and I turned up as a surprise at the baptism, having not really had much contact with them on any sort of real intimate level you know to find things like that out um and that's when I stayed overnight and she started to tell me about this little girl that was going to be you know off she was already and she'd been in foster care from the moment she got out of the hospital um and she was going to be you know she needed a forever family so we we kind of thought that we wouldn't get her because I'm not legally um her kin, you know, if you know what I mean, because I was illegally adopted out of that family. So it was a bit of a journey to kind of go through social services and explain the connection and would we legally be allowed to have, you know, this child. And we had to go through such a huge process of, you know, interviews and the whole background checks. And obviously with my background, you know, it's, you know, there's there's, there's um, criminal records there. My husband... Um, he was a heroin addict as well uh, before I met him, but he had a lot of criminal activity on his. And we kind of thought, oh gosh, we're not we're not going to pass all these things that we have to pass because of our backgrounds. And and then we and actually we were very honest with the the whole system, and they appreciated our honesty and felt that because of where Georgie was coming from, from you know, addicted parents, we would be able to talk to her about that and about why, you know, you become an addict and whatever, whatever, and how some people can come out of it and some people maybe can't. They kind of felt that was a bonus, you know, for 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 this particular child to come into our lives, you know. Um, and then just as we were getting towards the end of the process, my husband got cancer. He was diagnosed with cancer and uh, he had chemotherapy and surgery. He's completely clear now. But again, that was a bit of a shock. We were like, oh no, can we take on a child with, you know, because immediately you get that word said to you, you think that's it, it's all over. But um, his prognosis was really good. So again, that, that they were fine to continue with the process. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, it's I can't say it's been easy because, you know, we... We knew that Georgie was going to have difficulties, but the extent of the difficulties, you know, we weren't entirely sure, neither was anybody else, because with the, the brain bleed, it was, well, what is actually, you know, what, how is it going to affect her? But um, so it's been a difficult journey, but it's just been so uh, worth it because she's still in the family. You know, her identity is well-rounded. You know, yes, she's adopted, she's with us, but she has contact with her natural family, which is, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, part of some of the things I do with MPs, our our, uh, government system here is I'm trying to work on getting some kind of bill through where, you know, if there is no danger from grandparents and whatever, 
why are adopted people, you know, can they not just have a little, you know, clause in the adoption thing where if Nana is a safe person, then, you know, why should Nana suffer, you know, because of the, the daughter or the son or whatever? You know, it's just a little thing of mine. That I just feel it just, it, it would help any adoptee to have some kind of connection, you know. Well, I'm curious because, you know, Amanda and I have our own journey through the all the kids and all the things we've walked through. Um, what was that? What was it? Were your husband's involvement in this like? Was it something that he was right on board with you, or because I'm gonna assume he's probably not in his twenties anymore, you know? So, you know, <laughs> I mean, I I don't know. Maybe maybe you snagged a real young one, but <laughs> I did actually. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit younger. He's forty three. So. Yeah, I do have a younger husband. Yeah, but he's um, that age to be willing to take on a, a kid that's not his biological kin. You know, what was that like for him and that conversation the conversations you guys had around that? Yeah, I mean he he because you know we we had had that word and whatever and you know he he kind of believed as well that you know this child was you know the child that we we're going to have regardless of that he, he was a little concerned about the difficulties that she might have um you know I, I am kind of someone I've worked with um adults and children with difficulties but, so I, I was I wasn't it wasn't going to be a shock to me whereas for him he was a little more um guarded as to would we manage if it because we were told that she would never walk um but whereas she runs rings around everybody you know she can walk perfectly well but um so there was those kind of little things but at the at the back of it all you know both him and I we both knew that she was our child she was the child that God had promised us so um we just went full steam ahead really to to make that to make this home her home so that she could remain as part of her own family Wow. Wow. Yeah. As it turns out, we, again, it comes down to those plans. God's plans are not always ours. Right. And yeah. sometimes you just have to forget what the experts say and they tell you that this will never work. It'll never happen. And mm -hmm. you find out that they're wrong usually, you know, yeah. so I, I am kind of curious about this because here, here in the States, you know, I live in, in Missouri and we, um, we had a little girl stay with us for a while and her grandparents were over in Illinois, which is just next door. They were only 20 miles across the state line. And yeah. so in order to cross state lines, um, well, if, if they had lived here in Missouri, they wanted placement of the little girl and they were, you know, that were, as far as I know, still are great people. And so if they had lived here, here in the state somewhere, um, they would have called us and let us know that, Hey, we found a placement, a biological placement. And probably that afternoon or the next, they would have come and picked her up with her stuff and taken her over to stay with her biological grandparents, which is great. I, nothing wrong with that. The problem comes yeah. in that since they lived across the state line, that involves the ICPC, which if you're in the States and in the system, you know what that means is interstate compact, something or other. I don't know, but basically it's, it's the, the governmental bridge that moves from one state to another. And instead mm -hmm. of that, you know, today or maybe tomorrow moving, it was months. It was uh, more than six months before she was able to cross that state line by those 20 miles or so that they lived inside of the next state over. How, yeah. how difficult is that over there in, in, the, in Europe? You know, because you're dealing with, you know, from England to Scotland. I can't imagine crossing country lines like that would be simple. Or maybe it's easier than I think. We had a few problems, yeah. Um, yeah, we had a few problems with the legalities because when when we got Georgie from Scotland, it was called a kinship order, which, you know, you're kin and you're taking her on. But as soon as she crossed the border, um, in Scotland on a kinship order, she'd be safe. The parents wouldn't be allowed to come and just take her. As soon as she crossed the border, we were then not under the kinship order because we were not in Scotland. So the parents could have come to the door and, and lifted the child. So we had to very quickly, which nothing in the judicial system happens quickly, we had to get a special guardianship order, which made her safe in England, you know, which was uh, that, I mean, that was a lot of 
court appearances and, and you know, a lot of information again given. And we, we put in a special order to change our name, just our second name to our name, just for school and all the things so that everything was the same, you know. Um, and we were told very clearly that that never happens. You know, you just that just doesn't happen. But, you know, for whatever happened on that day with the judge, she, she granted that, you know, when she heard her story and whatever and all the, the things because the, the parents didn't turn up to the hearing. So, you know, it kind of let her see that they weren't really bothered as well, you know. So we got the change of name, which is really unusual. Wow, yeah. I'm just going to keep going back to that God's plans are not our plans thing, right? When he makes a decision yeah. that I don't think that... I don't think that people necessarily have to agree with him, but it's just going to work out in a certain way. Yeah. 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 He knows what he's doing, doesn't he? <laughs> it's been an incredible journey. Well, wow. Wow. Well, Fiona, I appreciate you telling your story and, and talking about your daughter and letting, you know, kind of bringing that out to everybody because these are stories that are hard to hear, hard to find sometimes somebody who came out of a really difficult adoption who then turned around and, and did adoption right, I guess, would be the way I would put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It, just, it means a lot to me that I'm able to keep her, you know, in the family and she she can make her, you know, she's not going to wonder what her identity is. She's going to know what her identity is, which means a lot to me. So if you could t say one thing to all the grandparents out there or all the, you know, the people of certain generations that I'm coming into um <laughs> nice way of me calling myself old here but but people who are in that generation where you thought you were done raising kids and the situation comes up where where it looks like you might be needed what advice would you give to to these people who are staring at this in their own family mm, i would say you know if you can then just do it because you know to keep your child in your, in the family you know it just it really helps with the for the child to know where it's come from, you know, and who it identifies with and, you know, all the little quirks that, you know, we all have, we want to know where we got them from. It, it just mean it will mean so much to the child, you know, to be able to, to, to be kept within the family. So if you, if you can, and if you're able, you know, and there is, I'm not sure about in America, but in England, there is quite a lot of support, you know, uh, groups and things where people can, you know, jolly you along and help you with different things. So there's, the, you know, there is the help out there. Sometimes you do have to go and look for it, but um, there is help out there and, um, you know, to take that help so that you can keep the child within its own in environment and family. Well, hopefully whoever's listening can find that help and, and join us on, the, on this mission of keeping kids safe because just like you, I think that's that's one of our main goals is finding a way to help keep kids safe who are coming out of hard and dangerous places. So I, I just want to thank you, Fiona, for, for coming in here and telling your story today and, and just being open and honest with people because these are great stories that, and, and you're a true inspiration for people who aren't too certain how they, they can handle the situation that they find themselves in. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, Foster Care Nation, thank you for listening to Fiona's story. Now take her knowledge and wisdom to heart so you can create love and healing in your family and community. Be sure to come back next week. We have new episodes every Tuesday. If you'd like to share your story as a guest, you can reach us at jason at fostercarenation.com. You can connect with other like-minded people on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash fostercareuj. And don't forget, we have a Patreon account where you can support our mission for as little as $5 a month. It's at patreon.com slash fostercarenation. The links to everything are in the show notes in your podcast player or at fostercarenation.com. And as always, you are so super awesome. I thank you guys. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Unparalleled Studios. Studios. Studios.